Imagine what 7 billion humans could accomplish if we loved and respected one another. If everyone was running their own race, but cheering for all others at the same time. Now, unity, of course, is not that we all are the same or that we all do the same. Being united means that despite our differences, we are able to work as one. And we need each other. In a real sense, we are all part in an inescapable network of mutuality. But you've got to stick together and strive side by side, not afraid of anything. You all become the temple of God. This is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Would you worship the Lord in prayer with me at this time as we ask God to speak to our hearts? God, we thank you for you alone are worthy to be praised. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, God, you have been so incredible and amazing. We thank you for the precious privilege that you give us to honor you in spirit and in truth. And as we prepare our hearts to hear what thus says the Lord, challenge us. Push us, transform us. Now, God, as we stand, I pray that you allow this preacher to share your word with clarity and understanding. I pray, God, that we not just be hearers of your word, but doers of your word as well. We give you glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad. And are you excited and grateful? to be in worship on today to our tab global family we bless you to our tab in person family we thank you let me first say thank you so much for the love that so many of you have shared as we have celebrated 17 years together as pastor and people and so man it was just overwhelming and i will tell you i am the better because of the decision god made 17 years ago to allow me to do life with the most incredible and impactful people in the world the tabernacle baptist church so thank you so much uh, for so many prayers and so many things and I look forward to many, 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 many more years together of sharing and trying to grow. Thank y'all for being patient with this old preacher. Amen. I really appreciate that as well. Well, we're going to turn your attention to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, we're continuing our series, UNITY. A couple of things. Number one, pray for your pastor. I'm not feeling the absolute best today. I'm it was almost touch and go if we was going to be able to share today, but thank God for his grace. Number two, I said this when we began in the book of Ephesians, um, that it is the epistle, a letter that Paul writes. And so I told you that my aim is to just say what it says. Well, today is one of those messages. This is one of those highlighted messages. I ain't got much more than what it say because it's going to say what it says. And so you just got to either take it. Or leave it. Don't get mad at the preacher. Amen. Look at somebody tell them, don't get mad at the preacher. It just says what it says. Amen. Yeah. Okay, y'all don't believe me. All right, Ephesians 4. Uh, we're going to read verses 17 through chapter 5, verse 5, as we continue to move forward in the next few weeks of concluding this missive. Here is the word of God for us today. I'm reading from the CSB, once again, Ephesians 4. And it reads this way. Therefore, I say this and testify unto the Lord, you should no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thoughts. They are darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them and because of the hardness of their hearts. They became callous and gave themselves over to promiscuity for the practice of every kind of impurity with a desire for more and more. But that is not how you came to know Christ, assuming you heard about him and were taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, to take off your former way of life, the old self that is corrupted by deceitful desires, to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, to put on the new self, the one created according to God's likeness and righteousness and purity of the truth. Therefore, put in away lying, speak the truth, each one to his neighbor, because we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Don't give the devil an opportunity. Let the thief no longer steal. Instead, it's to do honest work with their own hands so they have something to share with anyone in need. No foul language. I told y'all to get tight then. 
should come from your mouth, but only what is good for building up someone in need so that it gives grace to those who hear. And don't grieve God's Holy Spirit. You were sealed by him for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and anger and wrath, shouting and slander be removed from you along with all malice. And be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you. Chapter 5. Therefore be imitators of God as dearly loved children and walk in love as Christ also loved us and gave himself for us, a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. But sexual immorality and any impurity or greed should not even be heard of among you as is proper for saints. Obscene and foolish talking of crude jokings are not suitable, but rather giving thanks. For know and recognize this, every sexually immoral or impure greedy person who's an idolater does not have an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Do me a favor, turn to somebody and tell them, ouch, ouch, ouch. Amen. Well, today I want to just continue our series. I want to talk through what Paul is sharing in this moment. I want to talk from this idea today. You are not who you were. You are not who you were. Lord speak. Your people need to hear. Amen. Amen. It is said that the eagle has one of the longest lifespan of their species. They can live upwards of 70 some years. However, my brothers and sisters, it is around year 40 that the eagle has to make an incredible decision. Because by the time they reach 40, their beaks have become dull. The talons that are on their hands and claws, which are, have lost their sharpness, and they begin to lose their ability to fly high because of the density of their feathers. So at the age of 40, the eagle has to make a decision. And the decision that eagle has to make is, will it go through the transformation to continue to live? This process takes about five months or 150 days. And so what is typically done is the eagle will find itself a way. It will go to a secluded space. And when it goes to the secluded space, it would beat its beak upon the rocks until its beak comes off. It would scratch its talons on the hard surfaces and it would pluck out all of its feathers. And for a while, that eagle, which will be beakless and clawless and featherless, will stay there until a new beak is formed, new talons have grown, and its feathers have come out. After this period, this eagle can continue to fly. It can go higher and live further, but it's only predicated upon its willingness to submit to transformation. And in order for it to grow, it can't stay the same. It has to be changed. That, my brothers and sisters, I think is a powerful premise, not only for the ego, but I believe it is also in the words of Paul for all of us who have been called, set apart, and saved and sealed by God. That has been the real aim of his letter to the church in Ephesus. It has been him trying to explain to us about the wonderful works of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He spent the first three chapters of this incredible missive reminding us of this incredible work through the mystery of Jesus Christ, that through his redemptive act, we have been saved, but not just saved for nothing, we've been saved for something, and part of the gift that was provided to us was we were saved to be a part of the church. That's why the first three chapters is important in Ephesians. For us to understand it, it is there he provides us the theory of his thing. That's why it concludes with that wonderful doxology that our God can do exceedingly abundantly more than we can ask or think according to the power that is working in us. But as we move into chapters four that will take us throughout the duration of the finishing portion of Ephesians, understand that Paul now moves, watch this, from the theory of why we have been saved, a theory of why we have been unified to now the practical aspects of what that lives out in our everyday life. I'm grateful for our dream team that shared a few weeks ago that did the first 16 verses of chapter 4. In chapter 4, the first 16 verses, we were reminded that part of what it provides for us is that we have been unified in faith, we have, been, have diversity in gifts, and we have maturity in truth. That in other words, what we learn 
learned in those 16 verses that started this transitional portion that Paul wants to lay the claim about how we live this out in our everyday life is that there is one Lord, one baptism, one faith, that we are unified in our understanding and unified in our faith. But we also have a diversity of gifts that if we are to do our part, that each and every one of us must make sure that we do what we have been called and created to do. God gifts us with particular gifts in the church that helps to equip the body to function at its best. Which means, my brothers and sisters, that the gift that God gives us, whether it's apostles and prophets and evangelists, pastors and teachers, is to help you and I do the ministry that God has assigned to our lives. But then that can only happen as we grow in our maturity in the truth. That literally what he says is that you can no longer act like children. That once you know better, you ought to do better. That that ought to challenge our lives to make sure that we're operating at the full potential and possibilities that God has graced us in the fact that God has saved us and sealed us for greater works. That's what moves us into the next portion today. And I will acknowledge that it seems that as he transitions from verse 16 to verse 17, he moves from a corporate understanding to a more personal understanding because what he does is he lets us know the responsibilities that we have as individuals to live out this saved life. I would just offer for you and I that what he pushes us to do is to know that we must make sure that our relationship with God is in the right place. It, it takes a process. If I was to outline the process that I would offer that perhaps Paul would say to you and I that if we are to individually be who God wants us to be, it takes us to a certain process. First of all, that process involves us embracing the nearness of God, which means that we know that God is close to us that God is right there with us. But it's not just the nearness of God that we ought to embrace, but also, number two, we ought to cling to the character of God. That once we know who God is and what God stands for, that ought to be the very essence for which we begin to model our own lives. But it's not just embracing the nearness of God and the character of God. But number three, we also understand that if this relationship with God is to work at its full potential, watch this, we must be willing to confess our sins. Oh, I knew I wouldn't get too many amens on that. And I hope that Tab Global is rocking with me because I know, I know perhaps this is the wrong sermon for the wrong crowd because, you know, many of us assume we ain't got no sins. Uh, but let me go ahead and remind you for you pseudo spiritual saints in the house uh, that the scriptures remind us all have sinned. It's not y'all, because you know, sometimes we be speaking with that southern drawl. He didn't say y'all, which means that you talk about everybody else, but all have sinned and fallen short of the kingdom of glory. And here is how you can tell you are a mature believer when you can acknowledge you got some sins. That here's the powerful thing that God gives you and I, the blessed privilege and responsibility that you and I, watch this, can confess our sins. We can be honest about our transgressions we can be honest uh, about our low moments because sin simply means uh, missing the mark and every last one of us pulpit included have missed the mark we embrace the nearness of God we cling to the character of God we confess our sins uh, and the next thing that happens is that after that moment we become new creation that one I want to suggest today, my brothers and sisters, that because of, of us embracing who we are and understanding that our sins are real and have the opportunity to not only confess our sins, uh, but repent from our sins, which means to turn away and go in the right direction, then we can operate in a new creation. And that's what I want to offer today, my brothers and sisters, the selected text for us today in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through chapter 5, verse 5, kind of outlines uh, this life for us. What does it mean to be a new creation? And I, I would offer that because I think that it is important for us to understand it because he sets down the parameters uh, about what it means to be our old self uh, and walk into our new self. He, he raises the fact that there's a difference because because our old self was undisciplined and our new self is disciplined. There is the difference. And he wants us to understand that because we have been changed, because of the work of Jesus, we can no longer be what we were, but we can move into the new one that God has called us to be. 
That's what I want to offer for us today. That's why when you read verses 17 to 24, it kind of lays down the foundation. It is here that we see the demarcation, the tension between our old self and our new self. I, I, I had a friend of mine um, that, that what we grew up together, a dear friend. And i never forget as kids, I spent a lot of time at his house, spent a lot of time with my feet under his mama's table. That was a dear friend of mine. And I knew uh, the culture of the church, but I'll never forget one time he came to school uh, and he told me that their house had to be fumigated, had to be fumigated because his house was infested with insects. Now, y'all, typically, you know how we are. As soon as we hear that, we're assuming that somebody's nasty. We're thinking to ourselves, uh, listen, you can't go over there no more because they got a nasty house. But I had been there a lot of times. I knew it wasn't their house. But when my friend explained to me what happened, it made sense. He said, Chuck, I need you to understand, we do our best to clean our house. We got everything together. However, the reason we have an insect infestation is because of our neighbors, that our neighbors have insects and they got roaches and those things but because uh, they are in close proximity to us no matter how much we've tried uh, because of what we are connected to uh, it has made us infested as well lean in child of God because that's what he begins to say that's the whole idea he says I need you to understand that because of the environment because of the culture because of everything that's around you uh, you were infested you had some old ways that did not honor God. That's why when you read the text in Ephesians 4, notice what he says. Therefore, I say this and testify in the Lord, you should no longer walk as the Gentiles do. Now, he's talking to Gentiles, but he understands that because of uh, their culture, because of their, their past, that there were some things that has caused them uh, to operate in ways that does not honor God. The ways, when you read uh, in verses 17 through 19, you'll note that he talks about it in three ways. He says, here's why I know that you had an, your old self. Your old self was manifested through, uh, uh, watch this, the darkening of your mind. He said, you got a dark mind. Your, your mind has been darkened. You, you have not been illuminated by the truth. Your old self seemed to be resistant to the truth. And it wasn't just that you had a darkened mind, but then he also said, because of your darkened mind, your resistance to the truth, you then developed a hardened heart. There was no sensitivity there. There was no need for you to even trust or be compassionate. And uh, because your old ways was uh, internalized, you had darkened minds, you had uh, hardened hearts. And then because of a darkened mind, hardened hearts, he then said it produced callous behaviors. That you no longer were trying to do the things that were honoring God. You were driven by your desires and not by the divine. That's what he says. Uh, begins to earmark your old ways. Darkened mind, hardened heart, and callous behaviors. But then you came into the understanding of Jesus. Because you began to bathe yourself in the truth of Jesus. Because you began to see Jesus for who Jesus is. It shifted you from your old self into your new self. Because your old self had a darkened mind but your new self has a new mind your old self had a hardened heart but your new heart got a new heart he, he said that you had some callous behaviors before but because of what Jesus has done in your life not only is your mind new and your heart new but you also got some new behaviors and I want to offer for us today that somebody can simply just testify Jesus made the difference if, if we'll be honest it is Jesus that has turned our lives around Jesus that has enlightened our mind Jesus that has softened our heart Jesus that has decided for us to make sure our behaviors glorify God and that's what he lifts up he talks about that demarcation that tension of old and new self and here in verse 17 through 24 he talks about that but then we move into verse 25 in verse 25 he says now since you are a new creation we need to also be honest about some behaviors because there are some behaviors that if we're not careful, we need to get rid of and some behaviors we need to put on and some behaviors we need to live out. That that's the whole way that he pushes it in this passage. Once again, that's what he says. There's some behaviors. There's some behaviors that are destructive. There are some behaviors that are constructive and there are behaviors that are reflective. 
He spends time from verse 25 to the next chapter, verse 5, by trying to outline these behaviors. And he says that you got to be honest about them because they become a good barometer if you are changed or not. So I'm just going to simply walk through this today, my brothers and sisters. I ain't got much more than what the Bible says because he gives a list here about what are some destructive behaviors, what are some constructive behaviors, and what are some reflective behaviors. Let me give them to you real quickly, uh, and, I, and hopefully y'all won't treat me like the earlier service um, because they sat real sanctimonious when I just started to line them up, and I felt like they were getting angry at me and throwing tomatoes at me. This ain't me. This is the Bible talking. It's the Bible that challenges us to make sure that our lives are lining up with how God wants us to live. Let, let me share them with you quickly. Because here we see, first of all, there is the exposing of destructive behaviors. And this is, this is what I would call, a uh, Reverend Tate, one of those highlighter messages. This one you just pull out a highlighter. And it's just best that you put your head down. You don't got to say nothing um, when I list these destructive behaviors, because I don't want you want people on your row uh, thinking that I'm talking about you. So just highlight and look real spiritual during this portion uh, of the sermon, because the Bible just tells it like it is. So when he begins to outline, watch this, Paul begins to talk about, he says, all right, he begins in verse 25 with a list of destructive behaviors. First thing he says uh, is, let me tell you here that you can tell this is the old self. This, he said, this is what you need to get rid of is number one, lying. I, I, okay, I'm in the Bible. Y'all, y'all, y'all. I'm, therefore, put away lying, lying, that, lying. Number one, first thing that's destructive is lying. He says here, stop lying. Speak the truth, each one to his own neighbor, because we are members of one another. If I had time, I would push it a little further. If I was to give you the GIV version, which is the Goodman International version, what he's simply saying is stop trying to lie on people. Learn how to speak the truth. Now, now here, here's where you'll begin to understand. If I had a little more time to explain it, I would tell you that this list of destructive behavior is one of the key marquee things that Paul is highlighting. These are, des- design, these are behaviors that destroy unity. So when he talks about lying, which are falsehoods, which are known untruths, he said, let me tell you why your lying is destructive. It's because it has the ability to wear down the unity that God is trying to foster in the body. Your lying doesn't do anything. It doesn't produce anything. So why are you lying in the first place? I know y'all ain't gonna say man. And I ain't got really much illustrations other than that. I just need you to know, Paul says, just stop lying. Just stop telling falsehoods because lying is a destructive behavior. It's, it's lying, that's number one. I can already tell y'all want me to move on. Okay, number two. He says that you need to be careful and wary of and get rid of is not only number one, lying, but number two, anger. Watch the text. Be angry and do not sin. Now, what he's not saying is he's not saying that you can't get upset sometimes. But when he talks about this anger here, he's saying don't allow your emotions to overwhelm you so that it causes you to sin. That you can get so mad that it causes you to act out of godly character. He says, uh, you got to temper your temper. Okay, I, okay, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I know none of y'all deal with anger issues. I, I, I apologize. I know none of you here has ever got so mad that you never had no problem. But watch what Paul said. He said, let me tell you how you should make sure that you handle your anger. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath, which means uh, get it dealt with now. Stop trying to let it fester for a little while. Stop trying to say, well, I'll just get over it when I get a no. He says, get over it right now. I'm not saying that you won't be angry. I'm not saying that things won't get on your nerves. I'm not saying that you won't feel passionate about certain things, but the problem comes uh, when you allow your anger to consume you. And I know you don't think about it. But Paul illuminates it a little more because he says, not only don't let his sun go down on your anger, but he also says, here's why you need to handle your anger correctly, because it provides an opportunity for the devil. See, when your anger is unchecked, it provides a foothold for the devil to come in. And that's why some of you under the sound of my voice can testify there have been times 
That because you didn't keep your anger under control, that's when the devil was able to use you as a puppet for his plan. So he said, the reason why you got to make sure that you are handling your anger correctly is that if you do not, that it becomes a destructive behavior. So the first thing he lifts up is lying. Second thing he lifts up is anger. But there's a third destructive behavior he puts in there. Don't steal. Okay, I'm, it's just the Bible. I'm, I apologize. Don't steal. He, he literally says, don't, don't take something that doesn't belong to you. He counters it by saying, just do honest work. I don't have time to push this, but as we move into later portions of the book of Ephesians, when he talks about this relationship between slaves and masters during that period of time, it was, it was, it was really um, something that many people would take advantage of others. They would steal from others. And here Paul says, you're of God. Your old ways wanted to take advantage of others. So here is how you do that. Instead of you trying to get over being an honest worker. Because I know what some of y'all say. Well, I don't steal, Pastor. I ain't ever put something in my pocket. But yeah, let's be honest. Some of us do steal uh, because you may not steal uh, stuff out of Target and Walmart, but you steal time. You know you didn't come to work at 9 o'clock. Ooh, yeah. You stole something. You took advantage of, of some moment. You, you know that you ain't have no more PTO left, but you decided, I'm, well, I'm, I'm not feeling good today, so I'm, I wish I had some time. He said, be honest in your work. Learn that God honors your honesty. Y'all ain't liking me here. Number one, don't steal. Don't lie. Number two, he says, don't be angry or keep your anger in check. Number three, he says, don't steal. But then watch this. Number four, no foul language should come from your mouth. (laughs) Don't be cursing people out. Okay, let me break it down because some of y'all are saying, well, Pastor, I don't ever use them kind of words. I've been raised better than that. See, you can curse people without cursing people. You ain't just got to use some four-letter words to curse people out. Here's what he means when he talks about no foul language. What he's really talking about is if your speech is not profitable or beneficial to somebody, keep it to yourself. Everybody don't need to know what you thinking? Y'all ain't gonna like me. I, I get it. I know you so saved, but you so quick to tell. I just got to tell people how I feel because that's just how I'm made. That's just who I am. He said that is a destructive behavior. If you cannot learn how to tame your tongue, if you don't have anything good to say, then just learn how to keep your mouth closed. Y'all ain't liking the preacher, but I wonder how many times I, have we fooled by that thing that we heard growing up as a kid. They lied to us when they said, sticks and stones uh, may break our bones but words that's a lie words hurt and oftentimes you got to be careful how many of us have wounded people uh, and they're still dealing with the wound years later why because some stuff you should have kept to yourself he says don't lie he says don't be angry don't steal and don't don't give unprofitable language And then he says, let me tell you how important it is, because these four things, if we're not careful, watch this, can grieve God's spirit. That spirit that sealed you from the day of redemption is grieved when you operate in these disruptive behaviors. That the best way I can can paint this picture is that Paul has been saying the entire time that we've been sealed by the Holy Spirit. He, he talks about the indwelling of the Spirit, that God's Spirit rests in us. But when you and I operate in destructive behaviors, it gives the word picture of the Spirit sitting there just shaking his head. They know better than this. I don't know why they keep on lying. I don't know why they can't be honest. I don't know why they can't handle their anger. I don't know why they can't keep their mouth closed. And here's what grieves the Holy Spirit. Watch this. Is when you have access to the Spirit, but don't utilize the Spirit. Why not 
have access because I know there have been times all of us will be tempted to operate in these disruptive and destructive behaviors. That's why you got the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit ought to come in to convict you and to help you to say, now you know better than this. Now you know you're better than this. Now you know you're greater than this. You got to learn how to allow because when we operate in ways that does not benefit God and benefit community, we are grieving the Holy Spirit. And what makes it crazy after giving that list, because some of y'all look like, ooh, that's a long list. It gets longer. It's almost as if Paul got happy in writing this. That just light bulbs kept going out. Yep, lying, that's bad. Anger, that's bad. Stealing, that's bad. Cussing people out bad. Matter of fact, let me keep on writing. He also said bitterness. Bitterness is when you've allowed something to fester to the point that you don't seek reconciliation. He said, when you have gotten to that part, that's another disruptive and destructive behavior. So you don't need bitterness because bitterness at the root of it makes you bitter. You can tell some bitter people that every time you say something to them, hey, how you doing? They can't even smile. Eh? <laughs> you got a bitterness problem. But it wasn't just bitterness. He talks about anger again. He talks about wrath. Wrath, watch this, is when you got anger that wants to retaliate. He says that your sole mission is to get back. Oh, I know y'all ain't gonna say amen. But I already, I already peeped the crowd. Y'all, that ain't your, none of y'all ever wanna get back. I know, I got it. None of y'all under the sound of my voice have ever been so angry that you become consumed with it, that the only thing you want to do is get back. Matter of fact, you don't want to just get back. You want to get back worse. You cut me, I'm maiming you. Oh, okay, I know, I'm, I'm sorry. That, that ain't this crowd. I'm sorry, ain't none of y'all busting windows and key in car, none of that stuff. I apologize. And then he says, shouting and slander. Slander is when you literally try to harm someone's good reputation for no reason. And then he says, laced with malice. Malice, my brothers and sisters, simply means with the intent to do evil. I've learned something in life. I've had people who've done harm And they've done it in two ways, either being messy or being malicious. Now, they both have the same outcome, but the intent is different. I can somewhat kind of all right with messy because some people just messy. You just messy. But when you are malicious, you have an intent to do evil. Paul says... All of these behaviors is your old self. And if you still operate in them, then you ain't been changed. You can't tell me you've encountered Jesus and you still lying and stealing and ain't being honest and can't control your tongue and got bitterness and got slander and operate in wrath. And get him out. Oh, I done messed some people up. Now y'all trying to question your relationship. He said, if you've been with Christ, these are behaviors because you got the Holy Spirit that you should always try to get rid of. There was a car growing up um, called the Ford Pinto. Most people don't know that the Ford Pinto was one of the most dangerous vehicles in the market. It was released around 1970, 1971, and... When it first came out, many people lost their lives in the Four Pinto. And they lost their lives, watch this, in what many would consider was not a big time collision. It was what you would call a rear end collision. And here's why. The Four Pinto was built faulty. The fuel tank was too close to the trunk. So if you were to hit the rear of the Pinto, it could cause the tank to explode. So many people would get in these accidents and they should have survived. But because it wasn't built correctly, they end up losing their life. 
Here's what's crazy. When there was a lawsuit against Ford concerning the Pinto, Ford said they acknowledged that they knew that the Pinto was built wrong. But they were more willing to pay for the lawsuits of loss of life than trying to build a better car because they were rushed trying to put it on the line. My brothers and sisters, can I tell you, I know that you don't think that this lying and all the other stuff means anything, but I want you to know it's a cost you shouldn't be willing to pay. There are some destructive behaviors. But then what I love about it, because he doesn't just tell us what to take off. He almost used the imagery of a coat, but he also tells us what to put on. So he gives us what he calls some constructive behaviors. Because it's some embracing a constructive behavior. It's right there in the passage, verse 32. And I'm going to give you these three. He only gives three. But he says that when you stop the destructive things, your new self ought to be kind, be compassionate, and be forgiving. Okay, y'all going to make me explain those? He said, if you can't do nothing else, be kind. When he says be kind in the text, what he means is you be an initiator of good to others. That you shouldn't have to wait for someone to ask you to be kind. But the posture of a new creation is that you find ways and you find moments to be kind on your own. You just be kind because that's what God has called us to be. Be kind. But number two, be compassionate. Have empathy. You ain't got to like them to love them. You you ain't got to like their actions to be empathetic and compassionate. He says that ought to be the characterization of your behavior. If you can't, if you're going to be kind, be compassionate. Learn how to just be empathetic for people. And this. If there was a word that the contemporary church needs to hear in these crazy times is we need to learn how to be empathetic and compassionate. God is bringing people in our midst that going to have a whole lot of things that you may not like, might not agree with. But at the end of the day, we're not called to try to change them. We're called to love them because we can't change them. Only God can change them. And so sometimes I've learned that you have enough the ability to love the hell out of some people. Be kind, be compassionate. Here's the third thing, be forgiven. Okay, I'm sorry, I apologize. I, 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 I knew this was gonna happen. Y'all was yay, yay on be kind. You was rah, rah on be compassionate. But as soon as I start talking about forgiving, y'all should have seen how y'all started acting in this sanctuary. Ooh, I can only imagine how Tab Global was acting. Mm, forgiven. Mm, mm. You don't know what it's done to me. And you don't know how I'm supposed to have. I can't do- no, 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 Paul said, mm, mm, mm. Forgiveness is an unconditional thing. And before you get high and mighty, he says, let me tell you why you should forgive. Because you've been forgiven. He says, this is why forgiveness should be easy to you. is because God forgave you. Okay, y'all ain't gonna like me. Let me go and put it there. He says, all right, matter of fact, go ahead and put on one scale how you've been wronged. And then on the other part of the scale, put how you've wronged God. And then start to weigh them out. And you'll know, man, how I've wronged God. Pales in the, the stuff that people have done to me pales in comparison to what I've done to God. And if God was willing to forgive me, the least I should do is be willing to forgive somebody else. I know there was a, 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 a preacher, a disciple by the name of Peter, that he was raised that question. He said, how long should I forgive? He said, well, seven times 70. And Jesus said, uh-uh, that's too small. You need to just keep on forgiving. You need to make sure that you always are in the posture of forgiving that's a constructive behavior be kind be compassionate and be forgiving I'm done you got destructive behaviors you got constructive behaviors but here's the third and final thing and I'm done you have some reflective behaviors because chapter 5 concludes his thought in this pericope because he opens by saying let no one watch what he says therefore be imitators of God as dearly loved children and walk in love as Christ also loved us and gave himself for us a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. Notice what he says. He says that if you got the right kind of behaviors, you shouldn't just have it internally. You should live it out. You should be imitators of God, which means that since we've been changed 
there ought to be some noticeable and tangible difference in how the world views us as changed people. You can't tell me you changed and you ain't acting changed. So he gives two things and I'm done. The way we show that it's reflective is you got to learn how to walk like Jesus. Because here's what Paul is living to us. And I get in trouble when I tell people this because many people, you make your example the wrong example. Your standard for holiness and righteousness and discipleship is not your pastor. It's not your favorite spiritual personality on social media. It's not your favorite uncle or aunt. It ain't big mama and them. They are good people, but that's not our example. The example we have to how we should walk our lives is Jesus Christ. Because he is the ultimate example for us because of how he has lived his own life. He talks about we got to walk it out. That there ought to be a smooth fragrance. If I had time, I would tell you that what he talks about is that like Jesus, that wherever you go, you ought to change the atmosphere. Because have you ever been in a room and you smelled somebody who had on some good cologne or perfume? It changes the atmosphere. Oh, what's that scent you got on? Because you can, you can smell it and it changes the atmosphere. Now, conversely, have you ever been in a room? With somebody with some bad perfume cologne on? Who that smelling in here? He said, your life should be like Jesus. It should provide a nice fragrance. But it's not only walk like Jesus. But then here's the last thing. You ought to want like Jesus. Because if you read the final portion, verses 3 through 5, he outlines some things. I don't have time to push the sexual ethics of Paul. That's a lot for us to unpack. I may get to it in the Bible study. But he talks about the sexual immorality, any impurity, greed that we have. He talks about our foolish talking, obscene ways that we go. And out of those, for Paul, he's really talking about how we have so many things that can get us off our right direction with God. The real word is not sexual impurity or greed in the passage or obscene talk. The real word that Paul wants us to focus on is idolatry. Because what you make as an idol is what you serve. So when he talks about sexual immorality and impurity and greed and obscene talking, what he's saying is you've allowed your desires to become your idol. And desires are not our idol. God is our idol. God is who we focus on. God is who we try to be like. And so uh, what our prayer should be uh, is God, give me the desires that you want me to have. Uh, Not that the world uh, wants me to be like. I have to forsake what I want uh, in order to follow you. Uh, But when I embrace you, uh, you give me the desires of my heart, which means uh, it is God that places in us what we should desire. Which means that when I'm close to God, I'm following God, I'm I'm trying my best to be the creation that God has called them to be. My desires, my wants ought to be different. I should want to be like everybody else, but I've learned that I am following under God. I'm done. Um, um, Recently, this past week, I went by uh, my armor bearer's house. Curtis, his son, uh, just enlisted into the... um, into the armed forces, so I went over there to pray with him. And those of you who've been following for a while know that when I, Curtis and his family have done a wonderful job of raising um, my little stepdog by the name of Deacon. Yeah. I, I, I made one of those COVID decisions, got a dog when I should have got a dog, doing COVID named Deacon. And if you've been around long enough, you know I've talked about me and Deacon's relationship, how initially I wish y'all would have told me that dogs are like kids that don't grow up. I wish I would have told me that you got to train dogs, that they don't know that you shouldn't use the bathroom in the house. Y'all didn't tell me. I found out the hard way. So as life began to open up, it became so much. So I'm grateful for the Merrill family that took on Deacon. So I hadn't seen Deacon for a little while. So I went over to the house to pray for Curtis's son. And when I went in, y'all, y'all should have saw Deacon. Deacon rolled up on me like I was the greatest thing since sliced bread. Now, if you knew our relationship before, this would surprise you because we would have, at moments, some antagonistic portions to our relationship. But when I saw Deacon this past week, boy, Deacon was just jumping on my face, jumping on the furniture so much. He was just so excited to see me. And y'all, I started thinking that moment, I'm just rubbing his face. I'm excited to see him, excited to see me. 
And y'all, I, I wanted to know something because I realized when I first got deacon, one of the things that I needed to make sure that I did was to get him trained. Now, training him had to be intensive because he's a hard-headed dog. Matter of fact, his species, uh, he's literally a, a bully pit. So you know they can be very stubborn. So I had to send him away for over three months to get trained. But when he came back, boy, he knew all of his little things. I would tell him when to sit. He'd sit, tell him to lay down, lay down. So here we are some years later from the training. And so I'm, I'm embracing with Deacon. And y'all, part of me said, I'm trying to figure out, does he still remember the commands? So y'all, I started yelling out some of the commands. And every command I yelled out, he did it. Lay down. He laid down. Healed. Came on the other side. Y'all, it was so dope to me. Because at that moment, I realized that even though we hadn't been together in a while, he still knew who his master was. Lean in, child of God. Can I help you today? Because that's what we ought to be when it comes to God. That when you have been trained and fallen under the truth of the Lord, even when you have some wayward moments, you know how to fall in line because you know who the master is. Why? Because the master walks with me and the master talks with me. Look at somebody and tell them, the reason I can act like I act is because I'm not who I was. And because I've been trained in a different way, I know how to handle my tongue. I know how to be kind to individuals. I know how to forgive others. Why? Because the new me is greater than the old me. Everyone stand and I'm done. Everyone stand. Lean over to somebody and tell them you're not who you were. You're not who you were. And it reminds us of this in the passage as we're standing. I've gone way over my time. We want to pray for those in our Tab Global family. We thank you so much for tuning in today. I hope and pray that the word was helpful. Now listen, our in-person family is going to be praying for you. You see the multiple ways on the screen for you to connect the heart of this church is open even in a digital space. We're so amazed that even here we are, not even at the halfway point of the year, over 200 some people have joined and partnered with our church. We don't take that lightly because we are just grateful that people throughout the world are considering this their home, me their pastor, and this their church family. So I want to pray for you because I know today's word is not an easy word. It's just straight no tracer. That there ought to be a change in us. That if we had an authentic relationship with Jesus... We ought to be different. God, I thank you for those who've tuned in. I thank you for those who are viewing at this moment and even perhaps later on and on demand. God, I pray that we would embrace the reality that we are not who we were. That because of an authentic encounter with Jesus Christ, we ought to be different. So Lord, help us to get rid of those disruptive and disruptive behaviors. Let us put on those things that are God glorifying like kindness and compassion and forgiveness. And Lord, help us to walk like Jesus and walk like Jesus. So Lord, I pray now for every person. I pray for those who are making the connection right now. And I pray that they would find this place strength for them. We give you glory. We give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on, let's say goodbye to our Tab Global family because we've been blessed. We're going to be a blessing. Go in peace and may the God of peace go with you as well.